morning, everyone, and welcome to the third in our series of webinars as part of BSBI's Irish Grasslands Project, sponsored by National Parks and Wildlife Service in Ireland and the Center for Environmental Data and Recording in Northern Ireland. Uh, today, we have Dr. Linda Weeks back with us, leading us through the second session on vegetative grass identification. I'm Sarah Pierce, the BSBI's Ireland officer. We also have Jim McIntosh with us today, uh, BSBI's senior country officer, and we'll be on hand to help with your questions. If you have any questions throughout today's session, please use the Q&A function. Jim and I will keep an eye on that while Linda's speaking and answer what we can and collate the rest of the Q&A questions for the session at the end. We really hope that you enjoy today's session and it'd be great if you could let us know what you think. There'll be a link to a feedback form sent out tomorrow. Now, I'd like to introduce Dr. Linda Weeks. Um, as most of you will know from last week, Linda is a lecturer in wildlife biology at IT Tralee in County Kerry. She's an incredibly experienced botanist as well as an incredibly experienced teacher and we're very grateful to have her here with us today. So without further ado, over to you, Linda. Thanks a million, uh, Sarah. And everybody is very welcome. Um, I, what I'm going to do is I'll just share with you uh, the presentation for today, and then I can talk you through what's going to happen. So here we go. So hopefully you can see that. Uh, maybe let Jim or Sarah know if it hasn't come up. Um, but uh, you should have the first page of the presentation today. So look, um, just in terms of, I'm, I'm not sure, I think most of you probably were at the webinar last week uh, where we went through the basics of uh, vegetative features that you need for grass identification um, in detail. So if you, if you didn't see that webinar and uh, it's, it's online, as Sarah said, it might be worth having a look at after this session at some stage if, if things are unclear as to what features we're looking at today because this is the second webinar, and I'm assuming that most people are familiar with legumes and oracles, et cetera, et cetera, at this stage. Uh, but if you're not, and you haven't seen last week's webinar, you're very welcome to stay with us because hopefully it'll become clear what they are anyway, if you missed last week for whatever reason. So um, just to run through briefly what we're gonna to cover today, uh, this should flick it, not, yeah. So today, just going to do a quick reminder of the grass features that we covered last week, uh, very, very briefly. Uh, a brief overview of vegetative grass keys that are available uh, for you if you don't have one of your own. And also then, what we're going to do is we're going to take uh, our vegetative ID a step further today. We're going to use the features that we used, uh, learned about last week to actually identify specific species of grasses. So in that, uh, I have chosen a selection of grasses today, about uh, uh, 15, 16, 17, around that, that amount. That's about the, the amount we'll get through in an hour, being realistic. Uh, but I've chosen them in relation to all the features, at least one grass will have at least one of the features uh, or, all the features that we covered last week will be covered in at least one grass. That's what I'm trying to say. So at least you'll become familiar with the features in relation to actually identifying a grass this week. So hopefully at the end of this session, you will be more confident and be able to go out and identify a selected number of grass species. And hopefully if you can even identify eight or 10 out of the 15 or 16, or even five of them, it, it's a start for you. It's, it's a, sort of a, a sort of a springboard for you to take it further yourselves and at a later stage. So, um, oh yeah, the other thing I just wanted to say is that uh, there were quite a lot of questions last week and thank you very much for them. What I've tried to do is the questions that weren't covered last week's webinar, I've tried to incorporate them through this presentation. And some people had requests about different things. So hopefully I've covered most things. Some uh, requests were uh, quite detailed in the sense that really you'd need another webinar to cover them. But what's realistic to cover, I've, I've answered as many questions as I can through this webinar this week as well. So just three main aspects of vegetative ID that we covered last week. You need to recognize and examine a selection of vegetative features. 
you need to be able to measure widths and lengths of leaves and different features and ligules, etc. And you need to be familiar with an ID key and how they work. So, and again, what you need is absolutely essential is a hand lens um, and a ruler for, for measuring features and an ID guide. Uh, and I'm going to give you just a run through some ID and keys that, that are available out there. Now, I know Fanula went through some of them and uh, when she did her webinar on introduction to grasses, which is really good. So if you want to refer back to her video as well in relation to ID keys, she's got some really good comments on, on similar ID guides and some of the same ones that I'm going to cover here. But I'm looking at them in terms of vegetative ID rather than just grasses in general. So I suppose the first key, uh, the, the, the Bible, if you like, uh, the original is Hubbard. It it's, um, was published in 90, well, the last publication was in 1992. I think it's from the 1950s, late 1950s, actually. So it is an old publication. Um, for a beginner, the keys are quite complex and uh, maybe a little bit difficult and challenging to start with. But uh, this was one of the first books I bought way back in uh, years ago. And the best thing about it for a beginner is the photo, the, actually the diagrams are brilliant. It's really good to have a picture. So the way I worked when I started off, which is probably the wrong way, but I, I used to find the pictures that actually looked the most familiar that I, what grass species I was looking at. And then I would go to the key once I knew maybe it might have been one of three or four grasses, according to the picture. It helped me then learn how to use a key that's only text. So from a beginner's point of view, diagrams in this book are, are really, really good. Uh, it's a bit out of date. Some of the species names have changed and the taxonomy has changed as well. But it's a book I still use today. Uh, I suppose the up-to-date um, Hubbard version, if you like, is, is by Cope and Gray at the BSBI Grasses of the British Isles, a really, really good book too. Um, it, 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 its aim was really to bridge the gap between the outdated Hubbard that we've just talked about and uh, incorporate today's knowledge about grasses and classification. Um, it's more complex in its classification of grasses because it takes in you know, modern knowledge about um, taxonomy, et cetera, et cetera. So it is, it's, it's, it's quite complex in its classification of grasses, but, and again, the key is really um, for more advanced users rather than complete beginners. But again, the diagrams and everything are really, really good. And it's a really good book to have. When you become more experienced, use the keys, really, really good descriptions, et cetera. Um, of course, we can't uh, mention keys without mentioning a general botanical key, uh, the Irish flora. I know I know there's a lot of British people here listening in and from other countries. So today, I suppose we're focusing on the Irish flora, but it'll, you know, the grasses that we're identifying will be relevant, obviously, to the British listeners here today as well. But um, from a point of view is from uh, vascular plants in general, um, this is a really good key, very few diagrams, not really a beginner's book, but it has a really good grass key in it as well, but it doesn't have a vegetative key, it's just a floristic key for grasses, just to bear that in mind. Uh, another vegetative key is the uh, Poland and Clement, um, the vegetative key to British flora. Again, really, really good key for more advanced users, not just grasses, but all vascular plants. Uh, I have the old 2009 version, but it's been updated now, and I believe it's got a lot of improvements and stuff in it as well. But again, it's a really good book to have if you're thinking about getting a key, if you have, if you have one already and you want to get something more advanced, it's really, really good. So I suppose for beginners, maybe we're more interested in more accessible keys and guides. Um, and these are the ones I would recommend. Um, I suppose the first one is the uh, color identification guide to grasses, sedges and rushes by Francis Rose. Really, really good book. Now it's quite a big book, so it's not really feasible to bring in the field really with you if you're out identifying grasses. 
um, out for the day or whatever. It's not one that you can bring out with you. But if you're bringing samples back, it's really, really good. Now, it does cover sedges, rushes and ferns. So in that way, uh, not all the species are in it. And also the detail will be slightly less than, than a specific grass book. But really, really good color diagrams um, really accessible keys as well. Uh, and they're, um, they're more simplified keys, I suppose, and easier for, for beginners to understand. And it explains how to use those keys pretty well. So um, just somebody asked last week uh, in terms of, is there, is there a place that you can get a, hab a list of habitats and the grasses that you'd find in those habitats. And I had a look um, and I couldn't really find anything specific, but this book actually uh, categorizes, its vegetative key is based on habitats initially. So if you wanted a list of grasses per habitat, this is the book to go to and look at their vegetative key because they ask you, is your grass from a woodland, calcareous grassland, heathland, et cetera, et cetera. And then you go to that habitat section to key out your grass. So effectively, you have a list of grasses that you'll find in a specific habitat. So that might answer your question from last week. That's the best access to habitat, grass lists per habitat that I could find. So um, the other thing just to remind you is that there's a free uh, grass key uh, at the link down below. And I think Sarah kindly put it up on the website there from uh, the, the Bristol group so if you want to have a look at that online uh, it's up on the bsbi website a link to it and then just finally uh, the id guide i suppose specific to ireland is uh, this the national biodiversity data center uh, grass guide now this has a not really a floristic key but it has it's categorized the plant the grasses into groups depending on their their floristic features but they do have a vegetative key at the back. So uh, this key was, was designed to be accessible to uh, beginners and intermediate people and people that are new to keying out grasses vegetatively. So I think it's a, it's a good place to start. And it's got diagrams and colored photographs of the grasses as well. So um, in terms of the, the presentation and approach that I'm taking today in identifying grasses, I'm actually taking the approach of this vegetative key in this grass guide. So uh, I think I've put a link to this grass key later on, but again, um, up on the BSBI website under books, the, the link is there. So just a reminder, what do we need to know? We need to know, first of all, uh, about the leaves, Widths, length of leaves, are they hairy? Are they not? What color might they be? The youngest leaf in bud you'll find at the tips of our grasses, whether they're rolled or folded, like we described last week. Uh, sheaths, whether they're hairy or hairless, open or closed. And as I say, anything that I mention here that if you weren't familiar with these or, or this week, they're all described in last week's webinar. Ligules then. Uh, here we have the ligules. Uh, what type are they? Comb of hairs? Uh, are they membranous? What are their shapes? Oracles, whether they're present or absent that you find here in the sheets. And stems, whether they're flattened or rounded, whether the grass is annual or perennial, and whether the grass might have rhizomes or stolons. So that's what we covered last week. And these are the features we're going to use today to categorize, first of all, categorize grasses into groups and then be able to identify them to species level. So here is a list um, and you're going, oh my God, where do you start? This is a list of, we have 80 native species, roughly. Uh, these, this is a list of 75 of them, uh, the Irish native species. Uh, uh, excluding are the really rare ones that you're on, you're, pretty unlikely to come across regularly anyway. So I'm going to show you a way in to split these 75 grasses up into simpler groups by using different features 
And then when you've got your group sorted, it's easier then to uh, identify fewer species, like identify your grass in, from a fewer species rather than trying to identify one individual from a whole big list. So how do we do that? Well, first of all, we have a look at the leaves and if they're bristle-like and really, really thin, you've got 14, one of 14 species. If on the other hand, the leaves are flat and not bristle-like, you the next thing you look at is the ligule and see if the ligule is a ring of hairs or a comb of hairs, or if it's not. So if you've got a ligule that's a comb of hairs, you have one of four species. And if they're not bristle-like and they don't have a ring of hairs and the leaves are flat and the ligules are membranous, well then you have one of four groups. So if the leaves are flat, ligule is membranous. The next thing you look at is the leaf, uh, the youngest leaf in the shoot, is it folded like a page or is it scrolled up like a, like a scroll, like a roll? And if it's folded, you've got one of 20 species. If it's not folded and it's actually rolled, well, then the next thing you look to see is if there's oracles present. And if there's oracles present, well, then you have one of on my screen, my little pictures are in the way. Sorry about that. I'll just put it down here. So you have one of 10 species. So then if you don't have oracles present and the leaf is rolled in the shoot, well, then you look to see if the leaves are hairy or not. And if they're hairy, you have one of 17 species. And if they're hairless, you have one of 24 species. So that breaks it up into six simple groups for you. Now, just a note, if, if anybody um, was, uh, if anybody counted all these species, you'll see there's about 89, I think, if I've counted correctly. That's because some species um, are variable and they may or may not, say, for example, some may have hairs, and then another of the same species may not be hairy. So it fits into maybe two categories here or two or more categories. So that's why uh, we've got some doubling up. That's why there's more than 75 species in this list. So let's use this um, to look at an, some examples of grasses. And hopefully this will enable you to go out into the field yourself and find these grasses and have a look at these features. And the advantage today, uh, at this time of year, is that most and a lot of grasses are actually flowering. So if you're looking at vegetative features, you can actually look at the flower head that's probably available as well. Um, and that'll help you just confirm what species you have because you, ha you can use the flower head as well. So just to summarize what I've just said, the order of features to check on your grass specimen, leaves bristle or flat. If they're, if they're not bristly, uh, are they, is the ligule hairy or membranous? If it's not hairy, if it's membranous, is the leaf folded or rolled in the, in the bud uh, in the new shoot? If it's, if it's not folded, then it must be rolled. Then you have a look for oracles. If those oracles aren't there, well, then you're looking to see if the leaves are hairy are not hairy. And there's the, this, as I said, was, is based on the NBDC guide and there's a link to that guide. I think it's 15 euro sterling or not sterling, uh, 15 euro if you're, if you're looking for it. Now, just to say, uh, I sort of had thought maybe, uh, I bought this little um, microscope here, this USB microscope. I'm delighted with it actually. I haven't used one before, but I thought maybe what I would do is I would look at grasses with you using this microscope live but I found that it was a bit time consuming by the time you get the grass under the feature found and focused and then the brightness adjusted. So what I did do is I used this microscope um, previously and I've, I've taken photographs with it to show you up close what features are, are, are needed for each grass. So if you're seeing close up pictures of ligules and oracles and stuff, I, I've used this just in case any, any of you are curious as to how these photographs were taken. So let's start with bristle-like leaves. Got two examples here. Now there are more, so just bear in mind that if you find a grass that doesn't fit into any of these categories or uh, descriptions that we're talking about today, 
it's highly likely that you've got another bristle type grass that I haven't covered. So sometimes when you're a beginner, you try to shoehorn things into uh, a species that you're familiar with, but just bear in mind that there are other species that it could be that maybe we haven't covered and you're not familiar with as yet. And that's where a key will come in, come in handy. So let's look at bristle like leaves. Here's one, it's called mat grass, Narda stricta. So we've checked the leaves, we see that it's bristle type leaves. So this grass here is noticeably stiff and spiky compared to other bristle like grasses. So if you're up in upland heath or acidic grasslands, you're likely to come across this one. And the way um, I sort of, without a key, is to put my hand, you can see a photograph there, put my hand just on top of it and sort of push down gently on the grass. And if it feels quite stiff and it kind of, it doesn't hurt, but you feel kind of bristles sticking into your, the palm of your hand, it's a good sign that it's, it's actually mat grass. Um, sheep don't like it at all. They like to, it gets, so they tend to uh, bite it uh, pull it out and then spit it out. So if you're up land and you see dead bits of tufts of grass, it's likely to be this because the sheep don't like it. Uh, if you have a look at the basal sheets, then just double check. They're usually pinkish, as you can see in this photograph here. Um, sorry, my, uh, here, yeah, so this is the basal sheath. And also trying to look at the basal sheath is quite difficult because it's such a compact, tight, tight, tight grass that to pull out little bits of it are really difficult. So that would be another sign that you've probably got mat grass. Just check the habit as well. You'll notice uh, that the grass actually, um, especially the, the wider uh, leaves that are further out from the plant, uh, tend to angle outwards as well. So that's mat grass. So if you're in the same, um, uh, habitat like heathlands and uplands, another grass, that's bristle-like might be the next one. This is sheep's fescue. Now again, just do the palm test and uh, you've got your bristle-like leaves, but if you put your palm down on top of, of this grass, uh, you'll find that it's much softer and the, the, it doesn't prickle the palm of your hand. Now there is a possibility it can be another um, couple of species of uh, bristle type grasses because there are other soft ones as well but that's when you have to look a little bit further to make sure there's sheep's fescue so uh, if you look at the leaves they're usually less than 10 centimeters long so that's when a ruler is handy to have just to double check and if you look really closely at the sheaths uh, here is a photograph of the sheath here uh, it's open if you remember closed sheets are like v-neck jumpers open ones are like little jackets so it's got an open sheath and also what it has is if you have a look for the ligule it's so so tiny <clears throat> you can just about see it here but sometimes you can't really make it out at all because it's just so so small and it sometimes looks as if there isn't a ligule there at all so if you've got a really really small ligule and uh, an open jacket if you like on the sheath you've likely got uh, sheep's fescue. Now somebody asked me um, about fescues and where you know how they all fit in. Um, I, I can't go into too much detail just with time constraints but what I will say is that fescues, trying to put them in context for you, fescues uh, were all one group at one stage. Like in Hubbard you'll find fescues are all Festuca species. But since then, they've been split up. If you look in the new BSBI book, you've got Festuca and Chidonarus now. They've been split up into two different genera now. So the fescues that are without oracles are Festuca species, and the fescues with oracles are Chidonarus species nowadays. And they're usually larger grasses. Uh, so um, just to bear that in mind, oracles and not oracles. And another one that can be confused with the sheep's fescue that we've just looked at is actually the red fescue. So just to give you, um, if you have a look at the sheep's fescue, you've got an open sheath, uh, but if you, and bristle type leaves. With the red fescue, the sheath is closed. And here's a photograph, there's the V there. Uh, it's, it's not split all the way down. It's just 
tubular, if you like, and just like a V-neck jumper on top. And also it does have bristle-like leaves, but it also has flat leaves. It has a combination of both on the same plant. So uh, with red fescue, the flat leaves tend to be further up the, the, the stem and the bristle-like leaves uh, closer to the base of the plant. So just bear that in mind. You might come across red fescue as well in the same habitat as well, but it's more widespread in other habitats and lowland grasslands as well. So if you have eliminated that, that your grass hasn't got bristle type leaves, that it's got flat leaves, the next thing to look at is the ligule. So check the ligule and with your hand length, and if it's a comb of hairs or a ring of hairs, then you have one of just a few species. So here is one, um, the common reed, uh, Phragmites astralis. So this is a big reed, um, I suppose maybe it could be six foot um, high. Uh, certainly uh, I'm quite short, so I tend to look up at it when it's, when, it's, when, it's, um, when it's in full flower. But you check your ligule, and here we have a comb of hairs here. And with the hand lens, you can see there are tiny, tiny, tiny little hairs uh, all along, just a fringe of them there. So the other thing you need to check then, if, there are ligule, if you've got a ligule of hairs, the next thing to look at is actually the width of the leaf, because you have a few species that have a ring of hairs that are really, really narrow leaves. They're flat, but they're quite narrow. This species here has really wide leaves. So you've got leaves that are 10 to 45 millimeters wide. So you can see a photograph to the right there um, that the leaves are very, very wide. So very wide, very tall, and um, you've got Phragmites, which incidentally is the only grass really that you'll find on every continent in the world. Um, most grasses are specific to a continent like European, Australian, uh, North American, South American, etc. But this grass is found across worldwide. So it's very, very common. So um, just in terms of where you'll find it, if you're uh, in inland waters or brackish waters, it likes to have its feet in water, generally speaking, or damp, um, damp uh, ditches, etc. Now, just to say that uh, there is a lookalike that we look a little bit later on in a slide uh, called the reed canary grass. And we'll have a look at that. Um, it looks very, very similar. If you see it from a distance, you think, ooh, I've got Phragmites or Phalaris is, is the reed canary grass, but it's the ligule that'll uh, decipher very quickly for you which is which. Hairy uh, comb of hairs if it's Phragmites. It's a, a, a membranous ligule if it's Phalaris, all right? Now, just somebody asked also, what is a reed? A reed actually is kind of like a general term. A reed is a tall grass-like plant. That's basically what a reed is. Generally, they're, they're in wetlands. So they can be grasses, but they can also be other um, uh, plant groups like sedges. They can be other plant groups like rushes and, uh, you know, like, and also others like bulrushes that fit into different families. So anything that has narrow leaves and very, very tall is a reed. So another one that you might find with flat leaves that have a, a comb of hairs, if you're in uplands again, um, is your purple moor grass. So check ligule, comb of hairs. Now the, the comb of hairs in, in um, millennia or purple moor grass are tiny. And sometimes if you look, um, just a little tip if you're looking for these, if you peel back the leaf uh, from the, the sheath, or from the stem, and if you're looking at it from the top down, you might miss the comb of hairs. So just peel back the leaf quite far and look at it from underneath and you can actually see the comb of hairs much, much easier. It catches the light somehow. So uh, that's just, if you're not sure, if you can't see a ligule at all, the best way to look at it is from the bottom up, upwards, angle um, from, from the bottom. So check the leaves then. And you'll see that the width of the leaves is much smaller than the Phragmites, say, for example, uh, less than 12 millimetres and a completely different habitat because we're in heathland. So the other thing to do is check the habit. In other words, the, the way the plant grows. 
if it's older, you'll find that it's a pretty tussocky grass and, and um, the tussocks can be quite high, I suppose, maybe 20, 30 centimetres sometimes. Um, they're large tussocky and if they're dominating the landscape, they're really hard. Uh, it's a hard landscape to walk through because you've got your tussocks and the gaps in between. It's, it's not very pleasant to have to walk through a pile of uh, millennia grasslands. Um, but you can also get them isolated um, little, they, when they're young, they're not tussocky. So just to bear that in mind. Um, and when in winter, if you're up in the hills or moors, uh, you'll find that it dies back completely and you'll find lots of dead curled up leaves covering the landscape. And that's your millennia grass. So um, those are two comb of hair uh, examples. So let's say uh, you've checked the leaves are flat, you've checked the ligule and it, the ligule is actually membranous. Let's have a look at the next group if your ligule is membranous. So if your ligule is membranous, the next thing you need to check is actually if the leaf is folded or rolled in the shoot. So here are some examples of where the leaf is actually folded in the shoot. So um, we've got our perennial ryegrass. Uh, lolium perenne here. So ligule is membranous, youngest leaf is folded in the shoot. So uh, it's like folding over a piece of paper and slotting it in the very top of the grass there. The next thing you do is just check for ligules. Now if they're present, uh, it could be perennial ryegrass. So you can see here uh, in this photograph that was taken with the little USB microscope, here are the ligules, or the, sorry, the auricles here. Now, just to bear in mind, when you're looking at perennial ryegrass, check a few stems and, and sheets uh, for auricles. Some, for some reason, some, some little leaves, junctions, might be missing the auricles. So you have to look carefully just at a few to be sure that you have auricles or to be sure that they're absent or present. So just check a few and make sure that they're at present on at least some, anyway, at least. Your stem will be rounded. And a real key uh, feature of perennial ryegrass is actually the glossy underside of the leaf. And if you are walking in a field full of perennial ryegrass and the wind is blowing, you'll see it shining and glinting in the sun. That's a really good sign that there's a lot of perennial ryegrass there. And also, if you have a look down at the sheets at the base of the plant, they're wine red colored sheets. So again, these are, this grass is, is often planted by farmers um, in their fields for pasture. Um, it's a, a very common agricultural grass and a lowland grassland. And a lot of our uh, improved or semi-improved grasslands are dominated by this species. Now, there are other sh glossy underside grasses, and I, I will mention one later on, but usually the leaves are much wider. So another example of a leaf folded in the shoot would be annual meadow grass. Uh, this is one of um, the poa species. There's quite a few poa species. Um, so this is just the annual one I've mentioned here. And you'll notice um, a key to, or sort of a tip uh, looking at it. It looks annual because it doesn't have any old sheets from last year on, at its base. And this, grass is actually very small. This is a gravel um, pathway here. So you can see the, the gravel bits look quite large here. So it, this is a close up of the grass. It's very, very small. So check the ligule, it's membranous. Youngest leaf is folded in the shoot. Now with poas, they tend to be quite flattened. Some of them um, more oval, but they generally, they're not really rounded. So if you have a poa, the two key things to check for is at least oval or flattened stem. And the other thing is that it has boat shaped tips. So just at the tips of the leaves here, if you have a look at the leaf, you can actually run your finger down the leaf. And when you get to the tip, you'll feel it like, a, like the bow of a boat. And if you, do, if, you, if you squeeze quite hardly, you'll probably split the tip because it can't um, stay together with the pressure of your fingers. So boat shaped tips and at least slightly flattened stems, you'll probably have poa species in general.
Now, POA annua, just to double check whether you've got annua or not, the key thing to look for are these little transverse wrinkles. It's the only POA species that has transverse wrinkles in it. Um, now, those wrinkles aren't always there, but if you have a look around, you'll find at least one of these. Uh, that, you know, it might only have one leaf that has these wrinkles on a plant or one leaf in a group of plants. So, but if you find it, you definitely have this species. And the other thing is, if you find a small grass that's flowering in the middle of the winter, it's likely to be this one. And somebody was asking about tram lines. Um, tram lines, yeah, tram lines, I, I, I find difficult, I must say. I, I have to look very carefully for tram lines. Some, some keys, and we didn't cover tram lines last week, some keys um, decipher two options, whether there's tram lines present or not. Just to show you, uh, POA do have tram lines. Sometimes they're really obvious and sometimes they're not. But if you have a look at this photograph down here, you'll see two little tracks here in the center of the leaf. And I've blown it up here. Looks like a little uh, track. That is what we call a tram line there. But again, uh, you have to look really, really closely. And I tend to try to ignore the tram line um, feature. I tend to, if I come across tram lines, I will go one way first and then the other way in the key and then see where, what way fits best because they're, they can be difficult to see at times. So hopefully that answers the tram line person's question. Okay, so another one that's folded in the chute is uh, a very common one is uh, the coxfoot, Dactylus glomerata. Again, folded in the chute, Oracles are absent. Stems are noticeably flattened. They're really, really flat. You'll notice them very flattened. And it's a robust um, sort of tough grass. And just to be sure that you've got dactylus or cock's foot is you can check sheaths by peeling back the sheath. And at the very, very base of the stem, they're milk white, really, really noticeably white here at the bottom. So you, but you have to peel back the old sheaths to see this underneath. So that's how you'll know dactylus. And those grasses generally are found in um, waste, waste, waste places and roadsides and roadside verges. And they're generally bigger and tussockier than the surrounding grasses. One to show you uh, what prominently ribbed looks like uh, is the tufted hair grass. Again, the leaf is folded in the chute, uh, no oracles. But uh, if you look at the leaves, they're kind of really, really stiff. And they, if you find a young one, you might even think maybe it is, is, it a, is it a sedge, for example. But if you look really closely, you'll see that there are ligules present. But what I mean by prominently ribbed, here's the grass. If we, I've just bent over the grass, curled it backwards, and you can see the ridges here and the dips, the grooves. So very, very obvious dips and grooves. And grasses that are prominently ribbed tend to be really stiff. So um, that is tufted hair grass. It's a big, it's a beautiful grass actually when it's flowering. You find it in woodland, damp, shady places and wetlands. So that's just another example. Okay, so what if you, if the leaf is rolled in the shoot, uh, the next thing you need to look at then if oracles are present or not. So Here's a couple of examples of grasses that, where oracles are present. So this is the common couch grass. Some people call it cooch. I just happen to call it couch, potatoes, potatoes, whatever you prefer. Uh, so it's also known as scutch um, and it's a devil if it gets into your garden. It's an absolute curse because it, it's rhizomes spread throughout everything. But um, a, a particularly, it's, it's a lovely grass head all the same. So, Ligule membranous, youngest leaf rolled in shoot, oracles present. Now you have to look closely. Here's, here is the, uh, the junction of the leaf and the sheath. Here is the oracle, but look, it's really tiny. This is blown, uh, magnified quite a lot. Tiny little uh, sort of needle-like oracles. But you have to look closely with a hand lens. Uh, they mightn't be noticeable without a hand lens unless your, your eyesight is pretty good. So check really, really carefully for those. 
uh, rhizome, the, if you actually dig, if you have a little trowel or something and dig around the base of the plant, or even try to pull up the base of the plant, uh, you'll most likely see these long rhizomes. Uh, they're usually whitish with brown scales on them and they can creep in all directions. So that's the common couch. And grasslands, wastelands, hedgerows, you'll see it quite regularly in lots and lots of different places. So hopefully I'm not going too fast or too slow. I'm just conscious of time here. Um, I might just speed up a little bit, uh, just assuming now that you know what you're checking for. So again, these are all membranous ligules. Youngest leaf are rolled in the shoot from now on. So what, what we're looking at now is whether auricles are present, absent, and whether leaves are hairy or not hairy. So here is, I, I put this one in because somebody last week again asked about fescues. This is an example of uh, Shadonerus. It's another fescue, but it's, this is where the genus name is changed. So this is the tall fescue and uh, it does have auricles. And another reason why I put this in is because the auricles look very different to other auricles. If you have a look here, they're like lobes of ears, basically like ear lobes. So they're not pointed or they don't, they're not claw-like. They're just lobes that sort of curl around the front of, of the grass here. So broad lobes and often they're purple. And if there are knees or nodes present, they're often purple too. And uh, a really good feature to distinguish this Shadonerus grass here, because there are a few that have broad leaves, is turn the leaf upside down. And if it's glossy and shiny underneath, you have probably got tall fescue. So again, broad leaves, glossy underside, lobe-like auricles, and a tall grass, and purple, purple coloring somewhere at least in the grass. So it's found in damp, shady places. Another one rolled in the shoot, but this time auricles are absent. Uh, Yorkshire fog, uh, here is the one with the pink striped pajamas. Um, if you look at the base of sheets, particularly at the base of the plant, you'll notice these little pink stripes. And that's from Yorkshire fog. Now, somebody asked last week also, would I put the names up of all the different features that I showed, what grasses they came from? But actually in this uh, presentation today, uh, all the names of all the bits that were last week's are all named this week according to their species. So hopefully that will cover it for you. So again, rolled in the shoot, no oracles. Uh, the sheets are covered in velvety soft hairs and you've got pink stripes at the base and found in most grasslands and widespread. And just bear in mind that if it's, it's flowering at the moment, but you may uh, see flower heads that are quite closed and flower heads that are quite open and they look very different grasses, um, but actually they're the same. When, before it fully matures, it's compact like this, then it opens up and flowers. And then when it's getting older, it closes up again. So the flowering head can look different depending on what type of, what stage is at with its flowering. But we're looking at vegetative features today. Okay, next one. More oracles absent, leaf rolled in the shoot. Let's have a look at leaves here. Oh yeah, sorry, uh, Halkus, uh, the Yorkshire fog. Also, we're talking about leaves being hairy if the, because we look, if those oracles are absent, we're looking for hairy or hairless leaves. So again, this is another one that's got hairy leaves. And this is Anthoxanthum odoratum, our sweet vernal grass. It's actually finished flowering now. It looks quite straw-like at the moment, the, the flower heads, because they finished. But um, this grass, uh, you've got a membranous ligule and uh, no auricles. But what you have are these little whiskers where an auricle would be, okay? So little whiskers like cat whiskers sticking out either side. Now, one thing that beginners might get confused about is they look at these and say, oh, I've got a ligule of hairs, um, a comb of hairs. But just be careful because often grasses can have membranous ligules, but hairs at the junctions as well. So this is a case of this. Uh, this is an example of that where it has a membranous ligule, but you've got little whiskery hairs sticking out at the edge as well. So if you've got those whiskery hairs and a membranous ligule, you've got sweet vernal grass. 
Um, what else can I say about it? It's, it's common, widespread, and it's got a lovely smell if you crush it because of the coumarin, which is the smell of freshly cut grass. It's a, a substance that's in some grasses. So um, lovely smell. And uh, just as an aside, it makes lovely flavor vodka as well. You get the recipe online. Okay, and um, again, oracles absent, but another one that has leaves that are hairy is your one that's found regularly in deciduous woodlands, and that's the false brome. Um, so what you will look for in this case, if the leaves are hairy and the leaves are more than four millimeters wide, and somebody asked actually a good question last week, where do you measure the leaf? At the base, at the tip? The best place to measure any width of leaves is actually midway uh, along its length. So anywhere in the middle is the, is the best place to, to measure. So just check the sheath. It's densely hairy. You can see lots of hairs here and the leaves are hairy as well. Um, here is, it's also a perennial. Here's a, a photograph of the base. Usually you see lots of old sheaths and old leaves from last year around the base. And it's, it's quite common and widespread at the moment. It's, it's flowering um, profusely in wooded areas or shaded um, trackways, etc. It's a beautiful grass. So keep an eye out for that one. So getting on to those that have uh, oracles, no oracles, but are hairless this time, the leaves are hairless. Uh, you've got quite a lot of species. I'm just going to give you a few examples. Here is the reed canary grass, a really tall grass. If you're in wetlands, river banks, um, wet ditches, uh, you will, might find this grass. And if you remember, we looked at the common reed, Phragmites, and this is the confusion grass from a distance. You can see the leaves look very, very similar if you remember from Phragmites there a little while back. Uh, and. Uh, from a distance in a field or looking across to a ditch, you might think you have the common reed. But again, all you've got to do is simply check the ligule. And this, in this case, the ligule is membranous, not a poem of hairs. But again, the leaves are very, very wide, six to 18 millimeters, usually not as wide as Phragmites, but they're still very broad. So again, just check the ligule. Okay. Uh, how are we doing for time? We're just a few minutes left. So um, this one here now is uh, leaves are hairless as well, but it's a much smaller grass. The, this grass is the common bent um, and it's found in grasslands and marginal grasslands and uplands as well. Uh, beautiful little grass. And you can see here that it's carpeted in this field here. It's just a carpet of uh, common bent grass heads, it's in flower here. That is a really good sign that there's either rhizomes or stolons present if it looks carpeted and not tufted like a, a cluster or a tussock. So if you're finding it difficult to see whether there's rhizomes or stolons available or present, uh, a good indication is how it's spread evenly in an area. Now this ligule, uh, there are quite a few bents, and somebody asked me about the bent grasses last week. Uh, I, I nearly need half an, a webinar, really, to look at all the grasses, but I have, I have a bit of information for you on identifying bent grasses in the next slide for anybody who's interested. So, but just in this case, the common bent, Agrostis capillaris, check the ligule. It's very flat, so it's very, very short, and it's very flat. It's not pointed very flat. So I think of it like a, a per, a, an old man's cap. Um, and that's the way I remember it. Agrostis capillaris is the one with the, the ligule that looks like a cap, an old man's cap. Very, very flat. Um, hairless uh, leaves are quite narrow. They're 2 to 2.5 millimeters wide. It does have rhizomes uh, and it may have stolons, not always. So it looks smooth and carpet-like, and uh, sometimes it's quite hard to find the rhizomes and stolons, but just look at how it's growing in an area to give you an idea. Now, just to answer, uh, somebody asked about, well, 
more than one person asked about uh, bent grasses. I'm not going to go into this slide in detail because, uh, but just for anybody who's interested, people find uh, the agrostases or bent grasses quite a challenge to identify. This might help you. It's an abstract from the, the NBDC grass guide. Uh, it gives you, uh, you, what you look at is actually the shape of the panicle. That's the flowering head. You look at whether there are awns and you also look at the ligule, what shape it is and what length it is. So panicle shape, awns present or absent, and ligules are the key for bent grasses. But I, as I say, I'm not going to get into them now. Um, that's for another day. But hopefully, if anybody wants to look at that in more detail later, you're more than welcome. So I think this is our final grass here. Uh, and I've, I've included this because it's all over the hedgerows, near where I live anyway, it's everywhere. Um, really dominant, tall grass in, in, along the hedgerows and roadsides. It's flowering at the moment. Again, it's another example of where oracles are absent, leaves are hairless, and the leaf is rolled in the shoot. The thing you look for here is actually to check the base, and you will see that the base is rusty orange in colour. And if it has bulbous uh, structures like this, you've got the variety bulbosum. So it's uh, Aranathrum elatius var bulbosum with those little bulbous structures at the bottom. If it doesn't have those, well, then you just have Aranathrum elatius uh, simply as without the variety. So again, it's a, just, and the other reason why I included it here is that it's a, this is an example of a variable grass. So you could key it out. If it has no hairs, you could key it out and it would be in the hairless section. But sometimes it does have hairs and the nodes are hairy and uh, the sheets are, have got hairs, then it will key out in the hairy section. So that's where an example of where a grass might be included in two sections depending on what specimen you have. So it's a variable grass and that's why I added it here. But the, the leaves are quite broad, they're four to ten millimeters wide. So uh, if you have either hairy or hairless, you should be able to get to it in a key. Again, it's very common on the roadsides at the moment. So um, yeah, just to finish off with, I hope I didn't fly through that too quickly and hopefully you picked things up on the way. And of course, I'm, I, I'm very happy to take questions, but just somebody asked a question about grasses on the red list and I couldn't answer you straight away last week. Um, there, there are uh, grasses red listed and you will find uh, the list of red listed species for Ireland um, from the National Parks and Wildlife Service Irish vascular plant red list, which includes the grasses, but also all vascular plants. But I just picked out the grasses for you from that publication. You can download it free anyway at, at this link. Um, and it, uh, I, uh, I gave it to Sarah this morning. So um, hopefully when Sarah gets a chance uh, at some stage during the week, uh, might put a link up on, on the BSBI website for if, if anybody's interested. So this is the list of critically endangered, endangered, vulnerable and near threatened species in Ireland and list of species of grasses that are actually in the flora protection order as well. Now what I didn't include actually, there's some that are included in the Northern Irish legislation that aren't included in the Southern legislation because there, there's one particular grass that's uh, considered regionally extinct in the south but it's protected up north so just to bear that in mind so if you're interested in those you can have a look there now so just to finish off with hopefully um, you'll be able to go out and identify at least some grasses that we've mentioned today so do try to have a look at these grasses and identify them and if you come across that uh, come across a grass that doesn't fit it's probably, uh, and it's not listed here, it's probably a different grass. So do invest in a beginner's guide of some sort uh, that suits you best and just to get started with. And then as you become more familiar uh, with grasses, then you can invest in the more advanced ones and get a lot more information um, out of those. 
and do get yourself a hand lens if you don't already have one. It's all about practice. It's like a language. If you don't use it, uh, you, you, well, you know the saying, you, you lose it. Uh, it's, it's, it's keeping um, up to date and using your newfound skills uh, is, is the way that you, you, you become more familiar with grasses. And again, I said it last week, but just don't forget when you're confident about uh, identifying, um, do record your, your, your records. Record the species name, the location, grid reference, the date, your name, and the habitat that you found it in, and any other useful information. And do submit it to a database uh, either into the BSBI or in Ireland's case, you can submit them into the National Biodiversity Data Centre, um, or I'm sure you have a data centre in, in an area if you're in a different country. It's important, as I said last week. And don't give up, guys. Just keep persisting and get as much help as you possibly can. Um, support is always brilliant. So the BSBI as an organisation, and uh, they run field trips and, and webinars, uh, like you're here today, and conferences and stuff, and they're just really brilliant for, for learning from the experts. It's, it's the best way to learn. So I'd highly recommend, if you're not a member of BSBI and you'd like to become a member of the BSBI, I'm sure Sarah will fill you in there. So I think that's it. Yeah, so I'm very happy to take any questions, guys, and hopefully uh, that made sense to you today. Thanks a million. Thanks so much for that, Linda. It's uh, another fantastic presentation. Um, really useful, I think. And we have had a fair few questions coming through. So I'm going to pass to Jim to let him ask the first one. Okay. Linda, <clears throat> that was a fantastic uh, presentation. Thank you. We've got lots of messages saying how much people have enjoyed it. Uh, great. Oh, well, thanks very much. That's great. One, of, one interesting question was, this, this is about uh, sheets fescue, uh, I, I guess. Uh, with open sheets, are they open from the top to the bottom or is it variable? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I suppose the, the easiest place to see them, they uh, uh, open or closed, if you like, is from the top. So if, you, if you're looking at a grass to see whether it's got a closed sheath or an open sheath, look at it from the top because it's usually uh, more open at the top and then as it goes down the sheath uh, they get the two edges get closer together and might actually even overlap each other so to see them open is usually the top of the sheath is the best place to look yeah excellent a couple of other questions about some id features uh, one was if there's no new growth or presumably if if a plant's been cut or anything like that, what would you do when you get to the question about whether the leaves are rolled or flat? That's a good question. Yeah, I suppose if, so, if, if, if there's a grassland closely grazed, you're kind of a bit stuck, to be honest. Uh, but it would be very unusual unless you've got really a situation of serious overgrazing. Uh, it would be very unusual that you wouldn't find at least one shoot somewhere uh, that you could check but uh yeah it, it, if it's really tightly and overgrazed and you have an overgrazing situation and you don't have anything to go with i'm afraid you're kind of stumped really unless you're familiar with the grasses in general it's not a good place for beginners to start with really there so if you've got severe overgrazing and no evidence of uh, new shoots and you're a beginner go somewhere else, I think. I think it's probably the best thing to do. If, if you're familiar with grasses, you probably, you might know the species anyway, just by the look of it, but that takes experience. So I know that's not really answering your question, but I think if you're a beginner, you're best to try to avoid overgrazed areas to start with. Okay, I've got a question about um, agrostis. Agrostis stolonifera. Um, yep. It usually starts developing stolons after flowering, uh, and that makes it a bit difficult uh, early in the season to dif differentiate between it and other agrostises. What would you say to that? 
Yeah, Agrosta, it's a tricky group. And I must say, uh, most of the keys depend on rhizomes or stolons. And uh, I've been on my hands and knees looking for stolons when I need them and can't find them. Um, yeah, I just wonder, do I have my book here? Sorry, I should have really had my, my guide in front of me here. Um, I might just come back to that one. But if you do have a, uh, if you do have a, if you do have a flowering head, look at the panicles because in Agrosta stolonifera, the panicles tend to be quite parallel sided. And if you take a, a really good thing about uh, identifying Agrostas, if you, if you pick a grass head, hold it in between your two fingers and roll it and have a look at it in 3D, like rotating in your hand. And if it's a gross stolonifera, no matter what angle you look at, it, 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 there'll be one angle you look at it that looks very parallel. Whereas the other species, when it's flowering, they look kind of pyramidal or more like a sort of coniferous tree. Whereas this one has a parallel sided when you look at it, you know, at, at, at least one angle. So that might be a start. Um, and I should have brought my grass book here beside me just to double check uh, other things uh, because the, the ligule is important as well. And it's, it's gone for me. Why that I, think, I think it's got a pretty long ligule. Yes, generally, that's right. It? it does. Yeah. But, but yeah. I, I think also that the, the plant is generally very prostrate, even before um, it produces any stolons, it is very flattened to the ground. Um, yeah. I mean, part of that is, is sort of places it grows, like edges of lawns, I think you mentioned last week. Uh, but I think part of it is the, the way it generally grows. That, thanks, thanks, Jim. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It can be quite flattened and horizontally looking as well. Yeah. Thanks for that. Uh, there was also a question about, um, can ligules sometimes be missing from vegetative shoots? Someone was saying they find it a bit difficult to find them sometimes. Um, generally not. Uh, they, they should be there in some form or even the remains of them because there are some ligules that are really, really delicate and fine. Like, for example, we mentioned the, uh, the Glyceria uh, genera last week. They're the, um, what do you call them in English? The uh, sweet, Jim, can you remember? What did they call it? Um, sweet floating grass. Sweet, thank you. Sweet floating grasses. So uh, those ligules, if, uh, even very, very quickly, if you peel back the leaf, they, they, they're in rags and they, they tend to break down very easily, but they're there. So very unusual that you wouldn't see ligules unless the ligules are so, so short, like in some of the fescue species, uh, they're, they're so short that they look absent. But otherwise, you'll see at least, even if they're delicate and they're damaged, they, they should be easy enough to see. So if you're not seeing them, perhaps just look a little bit closer, unless you're looking at fescue species, which they can be difficult to see. Okay, I've got an interesting question for you. Uh, can grasses hybridize? Yes, they can. Uh, and I didn't mention hybrids today uh, because I suppose hybrids are a whole new kettle of fish, but yes, they can. Uh, and there are some very common hybrids like say for example um, perennial ryegrass with uh, a festuca uh, rubra i think it is can hybridize um, and also the, the the sweet floating grasses can hybridize quite easily as well so yes they do hybridize um, some of them are quite easy to identify though when you get to know the features well and they tend to be a mix of the two species so if you're going through a key, some keys actually include some of the common um, hybrids and you're likely to get to the hybrid okay through a key. But if you're using a key that doesn't have the hybrids and it's not fitting into any category, it may be that you have um, a hybrid. So just look out for hybrids um, in uh, sort of semi-improved or semi-natural grasslands, uh, something that looks like a fescue but not quite, and looks more like a, a, a perennial ryegrass, but not quite, you might have the hybrid there. And the other place to really look for them 
is with your sweet floating grasses. They can hybridize very easily and it's actually, they're, they're, they're more common, the, the hybrids are quite common and you're more likely to find a hybrid than the actual separate species in that case. So yes, the answer is yes, they do. Thank you. Good stuff. You had mentioned just how many grasses there are to be looking at in Ireland, but there was a question of how many more or how different is the, <laughs> the population in say England or Britain? Well, maybe Jim could answer that better than I can, Jim. Uh, do you know how many grasses altogether? Oh, there's certainly more in Britain than, than in Ireland. Uh, are you able to answer that question, Jim? Um, not off the top of my head, but I wouldn't imagine there's a huge number more in Britain from Ireland. I mean, uh, many grasses are uh, fairly widespread. So uh, I think all, all the grasses that are common in in Britain will be common in Ireland as well and, and vice versa. Um, I can't, yeah, I, I, I don't know how many more grasses will be here, I, but not a great extra number. Okay, great. And just uh, talking about extra numbers, keep an eye out that if you come across grasses, uh, especially if you're in a coastal area near a port, um, keep an eye out if you're keen keep an eye out for grasses that are, are alien they're not necessarily invasive but there are quite a few there's a variety of grasses that appear particularly around our ports um, that are brought up, imported on on truck wheels etc etc we've got since there's a lot of um, more eastern european people in ireland and britain now uh, there's more stuff being um, imported from eastern europe and we've Eastern European grasses can turn up actually at ports and stuff, uh, which are really, really interesting to have a look at. So just bear in mind that there are grasses that, uh, additional grasses that can appear. They may just be there for one year and not persist. In, in that case, they're casuals and you won't see them again. The other place to see grasses actually that are a bit strange is if you have a, a, a bird feeder with seeds. Uh, sometimes seeds can, uh, germinate under your bird feeder with very unusual grasses. So um, that, bear that in mind, that there are other grasses that aren't native and that turn up every now and again as well, that you mightn't find in key. Okay, I'm going to put you on the spot here now. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> during your presentation, uh, you showed a picture of uh, Chodonaris, uh, well, you called it uh, Giganteus, giant fescue. But a few people noticed that I also thought it looked more like the owner of Arundinaceae, uh, oh. which is tall fescue, I think, isn't it? Tall fescue. Oh, well, it is tall fescue. Have I got the name? Oh, did I put the name? It's tall fescue for sure. Some, somebody said, doesn't, um, sh shouldn't uh, Giganteus have long horns? And, you're yeah, absolutely yes. right. That is a typo. Thank you very much. That is a typo <laughs> because I have it as, let me just have a quick peep at that because I have it as tall sedge, but I've just put in the wrong name. Uh, there we go. Yeah. Thank you so much. It is tall uh, no. rescue, but I've, got, I've, right, I've is, put yeah. in the wrong name there. Thank you guys. Thank you for pointing that out. Yes, I'll change that <laughs> and I'll send, I'll send that back to you, Sarah, with, with the, uh, yeah, I'll update that. <laughs> Fair play to you, eagle-eyed people. I'm really glad. Those people are paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Because, yeah, tall fescue is not giganteus, it's arundinaceus. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, just going back to the question about how many species of grass in Britain, um, some, some of our watchers have chimed in saying, uh, Cope and Gray covered 173 species. Right. And according to another website, it's 160 species in Britain. So somewhere in that region. Okay, so there's quite a lot more, yeah, in terms of that. Great, thank yeah. you. Yes, but a lot, a lot of those species will be casuals uh, and yeah. with quite a restricted uh, distribution, but perhaps, at, as you mentioned, at ports and, and uh, docks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, right. <laughs> There's a few questions about equipment, um, mm. uh, and one of the very first ones was, um, uh, what is the make and model number of your 
USB microscope and how much does it cost? <laughs> <laughs> um, I was very impressed by the quality. Right, yeah, here it is here. Um, it's this one here. It's called Pluggable. Um, so maybe you can see that there. It's called Pluggable. Uh, it's, uh, and it, it, I just got it on Amazon. It cost about 30 euro. Now there are cheaper ones and are more expensive ones. They go up to about 160 euro and you can get ones for 15 euro uh, or around 15 sterling actually. Uh, but I decided to go for one for around 30 euro and it had a good review actually on a couple of YouTube videos and I, I found it actually great. So pluggable USB microscope. Um, if you Google that, you'll get that model. I can tell you if, if that's a little too dear for you, if 30 euro or 30 pound is too much, then uh, I have this one, which does a pretty good job, but is a bit fiddly to focus. Um, I think I sent Linda some pictures of aquatics from it and uh, it, does, right. it works okay. But if you're trying to present for others to see, then something with a, a more sturdy stand like, like Linda's might be a better option. And what, what price was yours, Sarah? I was trying to remember. I remember it was under 30, but I can't remember what. I suspect it may have been around 20. Okay, I'm very brilliant. cheap, what can I say? <laughs> Doesn't matter if it works, it's great. Yeah, and actually just uh, for, uh, there's a little, uh, little sucky cup here. And if I just take it off, um, you've got a blank sheet or you have a, a a scale sheet it's really handy for scale as well just so that you know that's great because one of the other questions was asking about the grid ruler that you were using yeah that's the, it the scale sheet so there you go yeah mine did yeah. not come with that i should say this is not a, a bsbi endorsing either of these no it's just what no we happen it's not have. Just uh, unfortunately to i don't know of anyone who's who's done a sort of formal comparison of the options out there um, but, but there are some pretty good ones. Just read reviews and see what works for you in your price range. Yep. Another participant asked the question about uh, hand lens. Now, I, I know you covered them last week uh, and uh, you even gave a link to uh, a short YouTube video on how to use a hand lens. But, um, and uh, the question is basically how close do you have to be um, does it does the lens need to be really close to the eye to view the, the specimen or close to the specimen? Uh, maybe you want to answer that. I actually have a hand lens here. So there's my hand lens. So if I just turn sideways so you can see, and if I uh, pretend that, uh, see there's anything here, I have a, 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 just pretend this is a grass, my, my pen knife. So you hold the hand lens right up to your eye and you bring the specimen up until it's into focus and it's in focus now. So you can see how close that is. So it's really close to my eye and the specimen is right up in my face. That's why botanists look really weird to non-botany people out in the field. So that's, that's how you use a hand lens. Hopefully that's explained. That. And it, somebody asked if you have glasses, what do you do? You can keep your glasses on. I actually, I, I'm long sighted, so I wear glasses, but I tend to take them off to look with a hand lens, but you can easily use a hand lens with glasses on as well. Sticking on the um, magnification point of view, um, somebody just wrote in to say that you can also get clip on lenses for mobile phones that work well. Um, they have one that's times 10 macro and it means you can take photos in the field. So that can be quite useful. Oh, nice one. Cool. Thank you for that. Um, can I, can I go back to a ID, uh, uh, ID type question? Um, are all grasses wind pollinated? Are all grasses wind pollinated? Uh, um, primarily, yes, they are. Yeah. They're, 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 um, they're designed to be wind pollinated in that they've got I mean, Fanula went through the floristic um, side of things there. So if, you, if you're not familiar with how a flower is structured, it's a really good video to watch back on. But basically the flower, it's not colored, it's, it's brown or green. Um, so it's not designed to attract uh, insects primarily. And also it produces a profuse amount of pollen 
uh, compared to an insect um, pollinated plant, which produces far less pollen. Uh, grasses, that's why we get um, hay fever and stuff, because you can see clouds of pollen puffing up. They have to produce far more pollen because they depend on the wind to dis uh, disperse to disperse the pollen. And also, if you look very closely at a grass and flower, you'll see a little feathery stigma sticking out, which is the female part of the plant. It's feathery and sticking out into the air to catch pollen as it blows past. And the anthers, which are the male part of the flower, stick out uh, far as well so that the wind can catch, uh, catch it and the pollen is released then. So grasses primarily are designed for a wind pollination uh, from every aspect. Yeah. Do you know of any grass species which are not wind pollinated? I don't, and maybe somebody else no, does, I, and I'd be very no, interested I, I, to hear. I, I can't think of any. Yeah, I can't, no. Might be one to uh, Google, but not. Yeah. I've not heard of any. Right. There was also a question about that I guess gets more into a, how grasses grow together. So are there any grass species that are sort of true companions that you always kind of find together? Uh, I suppose uh, true companions, uh, grasses are adapted to a certain pH or a certain soil type or a certain amount of water. Uh, uh, so it's just it's just by by chance and adaptation to a particular habitat that you'll find them together rather than being um have an affinity to each other they have an affinity to the environment rather and in that way uh, you will find them together and actually i meant to mention let me just go back into the slide here very briefly uh let me just share this with you um sorry no uh just to reiterate something that i didn't mention where is it now oh yeah it's actually near the top excuse me now sorry for all this just i'll be it'll get to it eventually it was one of the questions that was asked last week about habitats and i didn't mention it when i was on this slide um yeah here um just in terms of uh I, i'm not sure some of you i'm sure a lot of you have heard of plant at uh, if you haven't, uh, people were asking about environmental questions last week, and this will give you a good idea of what grasses actually are uh, associated with each other. Vegetation classification actually looks at, 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 at plants in general that are associated with each other, but they're associated because of the environment they're in rather than each other, as I say. But a really good way of knowing whether a, plant, a grass is likely to um, be associated with another one is looking at plant ash. It's downloadable free here. It's a list of all the vascular plants in Britain and Ireland, not just grasses. And it gives you, a, uh, it is a big Excel file and it tells, it gives a score, er, an Ellenberg value for pH, light, water content, soil type etc etc for each plant and in that way then you can um you can tell whether a plant is likely to occur with another plant and there's also a report to go with that so it's well worth having a look at that in terms of grasses as environmental indicators so um hopefully that answers two questions at the same time yeah okay is... okay i've got a good question for you i, I... I struggle to see hairs. Uh, is there a good background colour or card or way to see hairs? Yeah, hairs can be can be difficult sometimes. Um, I think if you're looking at hairs, the best colour I found is actually black. So if you can even if you even if you have your phone on a black background and put the grass on top of your phone if you're out and bring it up to your eye with the eyepiece. Uh, the black background can help. So hopefully that's something you could try if you're finding it difficult to find hairs. And I think another thing, if you're looking for hairs on leaves, it's really useful to fold the leaf over and look at the end uh, against that background. Yeah, that's a very good idea. That's excellent. Yeah, 
absolutely. Right, I think just one more question, unless more have come through. Um, someone asked, are there mnemonics to help you with graphs ID along the lines of sedges have edges and rushes are round? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, not that I'm familiar with. Uh, I tend to think in ty uh, rather than mnemonics. Mnemonics are great. I, I tend to think of uh, pictures like you know your Mohican for for Nardus for mac grass or wine bottles for you know perennial rye grass. So if you're a sort of a visual person like myself, uh, think of it in pictures. Just associate it with something. Um, mnemonics. Uh, really good idea. I, I, I don't know of any offhand unless anybody else wants to suggest things, but good to make one up yourself too. Um, can't help you on a ready-made one, I'm afraid. Either of you Anyone comes up with colleagues? some, they can send them to me and I can uh, share yeah, them around. Yeah, share them. It would be brilliant. Yeah, 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 absolutely. People remember in different ways, so the more the merrier. Brilliant. Uh, can, can I ask uh, one last question? Uh, this is one about keys. Um, what do you make of the grass key in the Clapham, Tooton and Warburg's excursion flora? Uh, it's, uh, it's a very good key. I tend not to use it for grasses, uh, but it, it, it's a very good key, but it, it would be for advanced uh, users really. But um, as keys go, it's, 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 it's an excellent key, but just for me, I just prefer the Hubbard one, to be honest, uh, and uh, the, the, for beginners, as I say, the NDDC key is a, prefer a, pref a preferable one for me. But uh, do either of you got any comments on that one? My favourite is Tom Cope uh, and uh, the BSBI handbook. Uh, the, the, the key in Hubbard is, is frighteningly long and complicated. But the, the accounts themselves are brilliant. Um, so yeah, my, my favourite's uh, the handbook, the BSB handbook. Yeah, well, I must say I haven't used. Uh, I, I have to admit I haven't really used much. The, uh, I haven't got my own copy of the BSBI handbook, so I can't really comment about that. But uh, and I'm, I, I, I have old habits die hard with Hubbard. But you're absolutely right. The keys are very long winded. Um, and I use it mainly for the diagrams and the descriptions rather than the key. Um, so I'm delighted to hear that the BSBI key is really good. Uh, and no doubt all the BSBI keys are actually really, really good. So um, yeah. that would be a good one to start when you're maybe an, more experienced or an intermediate to ex advanced person, which is, yeah. which is brilliant. Yeah. Yeah, I think Thank I you. agree with that. There was uh, another question that is not so grass related. Someone wanted to know who are your dogs that were running around in the background? Were oh, there dogs running around the background? Oh, oh maybe <laughs> up in the picture. Getting. Oh, oh. <laughs> out of the picture perhaps. <laughs> oh yeah, well, that's Jesse and Juno. Uh, I, I won, they won a photographic competition, believe it or not. <laughs> They were the, on the front page of a local calendar and we got as a prize uh, for being voted by the public of being the lo loveliest dogs. We got a free photograph, uh, frame photograph. So that's, that's Jesse and Juno <laughs> up there. Great agility dogs. Represented Ireland at agility in their, when they were younger, but they're a bit old for that now. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, I think we'd better leave it there because it's getting a bit late again. Uh, yep, thank you sure. everyone for joining in and, and sending your questions and getting involved with the project. Thank you very much, Linda, for another fantastic uh, presentation, really useful. That will go up on the website soon, the video. Um, no problem. Uh, thank I'm... you to NPWS and CEDAR for funding this project. And we'll see Linda and hopefully most of you again in two weeks time for Introduction to Sedge Identification. Yep.